Uh, last lecture, we looked at groups. Remember, very fundamental algebraic structures. Things like groups are called algebraic structures. And uh, we proved a remarkable theorem called Lagrange theorem, which explained, as a matter of fact, a lot of things which we encountered when we were doing journey one, things like little Fermat theorem and Euler theorem. Uh, but there are more to algebraic structures than just groups. Groups is, in some sense, the, the beginning. There are simpler things, things like semi-groups, but they're much, much less interesting. And uh, the next step is the next algebraic structure, which is called a ring. Uh, and it's not because people always wonder and ask me, so why ring is called a ring? Well, it's not because it's like a ring, but because it's like a criminal ring is a bunch of people, right? At some point, mathematicians started running out of words. What set is taken, what group is taken, so they used the word ring. Apparently, Hilbert was the first one who used it, and now it became a full-blown sort of established term. Uh, ring is something which, in many respects, behaves like integers. The, the canonical model of rings is an integer. If you want to sort of pick one ring which exemplifies rings, it's an integer. Sort of, it's an idea of, ring is an idea of abstracting properties of integers, right? It's like iterator is an idea of abstracting pointers. The same way ring is an idea of abstracting integers. Let us see what rings are. Again, they, they, as groups, we describe them with what are the operations. And there are three operations. With groups, we had plus and unary minus. We still have them. Every ring is an additive group with operation plus. It's moreover. Since an additive group, it's an abelian group, plus commutes, always commutes. There are no rings with non-commutative plus. So commutativity of addition is there. And uh, on top of it, we have multiplication, x times y, the third operation, multiplication. Right? So like integers, we could add them together, we could, we have an inverse for plus, but we do not have an inverse for multiplication. 1 over 3 is not an integer, in case you forgot. So we have constants, which mathematicians would write as 0 sub r and 1 sub r. In every book on ring theory, they will write it once. Right? After that, they will drop sub r and blissfully write 0 and 1. Right? We cannot do that. We will see we will, when we write code. We'll always have to convert it to R, to cast it to R. Otherwise, Ryan will cause trouble and complain. Every time I write code with Ryan, says, Alex, you don't do it correctly. That's a bad habit I acquired when I was trained as a mathematician, is that you have to say it once in the beginning, and then you could just continue without doing it. So by the way, in the axioms observe, I do not write 0 sub r. That's very typical of any math book. So uh, let me, by the way, give you an example. For example, if you deal with the ring of matrices, matrices give us a ring. Of course, 0 is not a coefficient 0. zero in the ring of matrices is a zero matrix. But of course, we're going to, when we do math, just write zero. And you should understand from the context, it's a context sensitive sort of use of things, that what is meant is a matrix. 
not a coefficient. So uh, axioms are very simple again, plus associates, because it is a group, after all. Uh, plus commutes the third axiom. Zero is an identity element. So these, the first three lines, give us axioms of an additive group. Okay? Then multiplication associates. And then we will assume, again, there are sort of some books where you might encounter definition of a ring without one. And then people will define a ring with one as a unitary ring. But I find rings without one unnatural, so I will just throw. I mean, it's a very typical thing to, for a ring to have one, but you might encounter books which say unitary ring for the axioms about, about one. Then multiplication by zero is defined to give zero. Then one is not equal to zero, very important axiom, because we don't want to have rings with one element that it's called zero. We don't have to have rings to, to be reduced. So we axiomatically say that one and zero are different. And then the essential axiom at the bottom, the axiom which connects plus and times, multiplication and addition. It's called distributivity for those of you who forgot. Right? So if you, you cannot just have two operations totally disjoint. They have to be connected. That is a very, very basic structure. And you cannot sort of do anything without encountering it. You say, well, how did people live before they, before Amy Noether sort of introduced modern rings? Well, they, they would just replicate these axioms in different domains. They would write them for matrices or prove them for matrices and so, so on. So examples of rings, integers, the canonical example, because ring, being a ring, is trying to, to be as much as integers as possible. Then matrices with real coefficients. Yes? So in a particular ring of matrices with real coefficients, we'd also say of size such and such. Of size such and such. Of size, say, two by two. The question was, what, what, what kind of matrices with real coefficients? Yes, they're matrices of a given size, two by two, four by four. Otherwise, if we have all square matrices, it would be difficult because they're they are not going to be closed under either plus or times. So matrices with real coefficients of a given size, Gaussian integers, by the way, going to matrices, they don't have to be real coefficients. They could be complex coefficients or, believe it or not, integer coefficients. Because when you multiply two integers with integer coefficients, you get another uh, matrix with integer coefficients. They're closed. And very nice. There are many very important rings of that nature, sort of, of uh, uh, matrices with, with integer coefficients. Uh, the most important is sort of matrices like that, where determinant is equal to 1. It's a very, very important class. So uh, polynomials with integer coefficients or with real coefficients. Observe that they could be univariate polynomials. Univariate polynomials are polynomials just with x, with one variable. Or multivariate polynomials, polynomials with one, two, three, or however many uh, uh, indeterminants. So, uh, There are two kinds of rings, commutative and non-commutative rings. It's historically happened that the notion of a ring evolved in literally two different geometry, uh, geographies. The theory of commutative rings was mostly developed by Dedekind, if you remember, 
Richard Derikind in Germany, then was worked on by Hilbert, and sort of then Noether inherited this work. But there was another work on rings done in Anglo-Saxon or Celtic lands, started by people like William Hamilton in Ireland and continued by people like Cayley, Tate, and others in, uh, in England. Sort of non-commutative rings are Anglo-Saxon. So go figure. Uh, eventually, they, of course, merged. Noether came up with unified ring theory and explained how commutative and non-commutative rings relate. So it was a great accomplishment of unifying these two, two things. But even today, there are two distinct flavors of abstract algebra, commutative and non-commutative. Commutative algebra means if you buy text which says commutative algebra, it means ring means commutative ring. They're not going to say commutative ring. They're going to say ring, but they will always mean commutative ring. It's an important field of study, mostly used for algebraic number theory and things like that. And then, of course, there is theory of non-commutative algebra with non-commutative rings mostly coming from matrices. Remember, matrix multiplication does not commute. So uh, from this point on in this course, we will be doing with commutative rings. So when I say a ring, I will mean commutative ring. This is, again, a very typical thing in mathematics. You sort of, you, you define things, and then you say, well, but from now on, when I say ring, I mean, and sometimes people say, well, from now on, and you narrow it even further. So uh, we'll be dealing with commutative algebra. Uh, by the way, not because non-commutative algebra is not exciting. It is very exciting. But because for this particular journey, we need just commutative structures. OK. Some rings have invertible elements. As a matter of fact, every ring has at least one invertible element. One. One always inverts. The inverse of one is one. So, by the way, if we have uh, many invertible elements, They constitute a multiplicative group, meaning that if you take two invertible elements, people also call them units, right? Because they're sort of like one. By the way, among integers, we have one is an invertible element. What else is an invertible element? Minus one. There are two units, and these units, of course, constitute a group, Gaussian integers. How many units do we have? Yes, very good. Four units. What are the units? One minus one, i, and minus i. Right? So four units. Again, you could multiply them, and product of two units will give us a unit. We could actually prove it. Uh, where do we put I? Yeah, we'll prove it here. Now, before we do that, well, sorry. You were supposed to do it at home, but I couldn't resist. So a product of unit is a unit. Again, this is a very simple proof from abstract algebra. You know, why a product of a unit is a unit? Because you see, if you have A and B, then you have inverse of B and inverse of A. If you multiply them together, you will get an inverse of the product. Okay? This is not a complete proof. To do it really completely, you need to move parentheses around by associativity. Right? Because you will say that it's also equal A open paren b time b minus 1 time a 
to the minus 1. You cancel ones in the middle and so on. Very, very simple. Okay? So a product of units is a unit. So you have this multiplicative group of units inside every commutative ring. It's a very not inside every ring. But uh, units are closed under multiplication. One is a unit, and inverse of a unit is a unit. So that gives you a group. Now, we come to one more refinement, sort of. You see, what you do when you deal with abstract concepts, you, you sort of refine them. Again, for those of you who know a little bit of C++, remember you have, say, forward iterators, then you refine them to bidirectional iterators, then you refine them to random access iterators. The same thing in abstract algebra. Well, of course, it's the other way around. It's not that uh, abstract algebra learned it from me, but I learned from abstract algebra. So you start with ring. You get commutative ring. And then inside commutative ring, as a sort of more strict thing, is a notion of integral domain. And it's integral because it's almost like integers. Integers have a wonderful property that if you multiply two integers, the product is not zero. Five times five is 25, not zero. Three times four is, I believe, 12, not zero. But it's not always so. For example, if you take a ring of remainders modulo six, Right? 3 times 4, the same example, is not going to be equal to 12, but it's going to be equal to 0. 3 times 4, as a remainder modulus 6, is actually 0. Everybody believes that? So 3 times 4 is actually happens to be what? 12. And 12 mod 6 is zero. So, so does that to deal with, to do with the fact that it's finite versus no. It has everything to do with whether it's prime or not. Because if you look at remainders modular five, it doesn't have zero devices. Right? So it's the primality which distinguishes. We will see it in a second. It's a very good question. It's not finiteness but it's primality. And uh, in any case, integral domain is a ring where there are no zero devices. The product of two non-zeros will never become zero. Right? So uh, examples of integral domain. Integers. Okay. Gaussian integers, you multiply Gaussian integers, you cannot get a zero. Polynomials, say univariate or multivariate or any kind of polynomial, over integers, over real numbers, you know, x squared plus 1 times x squared minus 1 is going to be equal x to the fourth minus 1. It's not going to be equal to zero, just will not be equal to zero. Uh, Rational functions over integers. There is a very important notion of a rational function, a ratio of two polynomials. Right? Again, they're not going to be zero if you multiply two non-zero ones. So these are examples of integral domains. Okay? Now, this you have to do by yourself. It's very important. It takes about 10 seconds. Prove that zero divisor is not a unit. I'm not going to tell you how to prove it. You have to try to do it at home. I really beg you to. OK, finally, here we're going to make a major, major sort of step forward. And uh, remember, our goal is to find what is the correct setting for Euclid's algorithm, for GCD. And this is finally a place where we will define it, 
or at least Noether defined it, the notion of Euclidean domain. You will also encounter a term Euclidean ring. Mathematicians are not zero. consistent. There is some book where it will say Euclidean domain, and I think majority of people will say it. But there is a minority which would say Euclidean ring and will never say Euclidean domain. And why it is, I don't know, because there's no standard. Sort of, but, pardon me? They don't have compilers, for example. But even with compilers, you could always do sharp sign define. Right? So, you know, but mathematicians tried, again, there was this great, great try by Bourbaki to, co to come up with a set of absolutely standard terminology. And I try to follow Bourbaki, by the way in 98%. Again, this is a fairly typical thing. So if you follow as far as you can, but then you say, well, it's getting to be too much, and you stop following. <laughs> so I try to follow Bourbaki in terms of using, using the, the terminology established by him. Again, remember, you have to refer to him as a single person. Otherwise, you're not playing the game. So, uh, so Euclidean domain. By the way, Bourbaki doesn't particularly care about Euclidean domain. It is defined in one of the exercises. This is sort of a typical Bourbaki, sort of uh, pushing things which are historically very important into an exercise because sort of in fully abstract setting, they do not matter. Uh, again, they remind me somewhat of our friend Gauss. Remember, he didn't like Euclid algorithm. Also, sort of, Bourbaki mentioned Euclid algorithm, but in a footnote. Uh, however, if you read the historical notes, and Bourbaki was good because sort of most of the volumes would include, pardon me, all the volumes would include uh, careful historical notes explaining how things actually came about to be. And in some sense, for me, this was the crucial thing when I was very, very young, and I was very, very young once. Uh, and when I encountered Bourbaki, I saw these historical notes, and that was one of the sort of influences why I think history is important. Because, you know, I was impressionable youth, and somebody important told me that it was. So, uh, now, what is Euclidean domain? It's an integral domain. Remember integral domain? No zero devices. It has operation quotient and remainder. Because that's what we need to write Euclid's algorithm, if you remember. Well, we don't really need quotient. Remainder would do just fine. But typically, people define both. And they are connected that. Uh, With, with the fourth axiom that for every A, you could divide it by, with, with remainder, by non-zero B, getting quotient plus remainder. This is the same as with integers. Sort of. This is just definition of division with remainder. And Finally, you have a non-negative norm. Here, norm is used somewhat frivolously because it's not norm. Uh, it confuses very many people because in, when you study vector spaces, you learn about Euclidean norm, which is you know, the bi-coordinate bi square and then, you know, that, that is called Euclidean norm. This is not Euclidean norm. And it is, of course, Euclidean norm. Except it's different Euclid. This is not Euclid of geometry. This is Euclid of number theory. So what this norm means is that basically the idea is very simple. That when you do the remainder, the norm decreases. It's a function from 
This is, this is a norm. It's some function. You don't know what function. But you know that it maps you into integers, positive natural numbers, pardon me. You maps you into natural numbers, and it decreases. For example, let us see. What would be a norm for normal integers? The absolute value will give us very, very good norm. Under the standard definition of remainder, where we take remainders in the re positive remainders, which you don't get in any programming language nowadays. So be careful when you use remainders. You might get sort of funny, funny problems. So polynomials, the degree of polynomials, Gaussian integers. What's the norm for Gaussian integers? Complex norm, typically. Well, or distance will from the origin. Will. But typically what you use is complex norm. A plus bi, the norm is a square plus b square. Right? So very, very simple. They all, the remainder will always sort of have a smaller norm. So what does, in other words, why do we introduce this norm thing? Because the norm guarantees what? Termination of Euclid algorithm. Because you do remainder, remainder, remainder. At every step, remainder decreases by the last axiom, right? And it's, so you get a decreasing sequence of natural numbers. It has to be finite. Greeks knew that. So, so should you. Uh, OK, so this is what Euclidean domain is. This is an abstract setting for our wonderful uh, Euclid's algorithm. So that's the code. So we have Euclidean domain with just while we are not zero. We need to guard because remainder doesn't work for zero. Yes, yes. Uh, here, how, how do you define uh, greater than? I define greater than, OK, the question is, what is this thing? This thing is not on elements of the ring. This thing is on norm. Norm is just natural numbers. So it is greater than on natural numbers. You know, 3 is greater than? The second line, b greater than 0. Should that be norm b greater than 0? Yes, it should be. Yes. Yes. I apologize. Uh, or it should be b is not 0. Yes, same thing. Yes, this is a bug. Somebody please uh, send me, remind me of how to fix it. It happens to all of us, you know, about bugs. Uh, thank you. Good catch. So uh, the code is that the guard against b being equal to 0. This is, this is why we need to, to sort of to, to go. And eventually, it will, of course, hit 0. We will get 0 remainder. But then we cannot divide more. We just return. So we do the remainder. And we know that the norm will decrease. So at every step, the norm of n decreases. Right? So eventually, we will terminate. That actually gives a termination proof. Yes? Smaller than norm of n or m? No, in this case, it's smaller than norm of n. By, well, I'm dividing by n. The axiom doesn't tell us anything about the norm of m. The remainder is less than n in, in integers. So, right? For example, if this is 1 and this is 5, 
the remainder will be less than 5, but it's not going to be less than 1. It's actually going to be 1. Just pointing that. And the GCD is an element of the ring, not, not an integer. GCD is not an integer. For in this, it could be. This code works for integers because integers is the canonical example of Euclidean domain. That's where we got it. But it also, remember what, what our goal was. The goal was to find a setting which allows us the most general use, but it will work efficiently and basically work the same on all the particular cases. For example, it will work on integers. So I'm not doing anything special. Again, the, the difference between abstraction and uh, sort of obfuscation is that abstraction, you do not add extra things. You drop things. Right? For example, there is a great computer scientist who now defines uh, generic programming. In his book, he says that or you have to add all kind of hooks to make this stuff work. That's what generic programming is. Adding extra hooks. Well, no, he's actually wrong. He doesn't understand what generic programming is. Generic programming is about forgetting, not providing more instrumentation. Right? Not making, it's not building everything in a kitchen sink sort of stuff. It's making the minimal possible interface. That's the idea of abstract algebra. We're not providing extra facilities. We're taking the same code and making it work in the broadest things without adding anything to it. That's the essential thing. We're not making you do some special tests or some something. It's all the same, exactly the same code as for integers. Now, we have to talk about one more thing. And you have to understand that mathematicians, I already told you with rings, they, they have difficulty finding names. So uh, for some reason, again, you, it's like notion of a field has the same notion as a ring or a group of a set. Field of study. When I talk about field of study, you don't think about flowers growing. Well, maybe you do. Depends what you study, but it's not field in the sense of a plane. It's a field as a, in the sense of a set. So mathematicians use the term field to mean a ring where every non-zero element is invertible. Okay, what is a an exact? Could you give me an example of a field? Rational numbers is a wonderful example. If you like, canonical example of a field. Everything is invertible except zero. P over Q, to invert, you get what? Q over P. Very nice, very simple. All right? Now, examples. Rational numbers. See how well you guess? That was my first example, too. Real numbers, it's a field. Complex numbers. And a very important class, prime remainder fields. When we talk about remainder rings, we see Z sub N. If N is a composite number, then it has zero divisors. Remember? Zero divisors? As we observed with remains this module is 6. Right? 3 times 4 gave us 0. Now, since they have 0 dividers, by the homework problem, you cannot be 0 divider and invertible. So not every element is invertible. So they are not fields. If you have 0 devices, you are not a field. By the way, if you don't have zero dividers, are you always a field? An example. Why are you not always a field? 
integers. Yes, our canonical thing. No, no zero dividers, but we're not a field. However, the remarkable fact is that if you are a finite ring and you have no zero devices, then you are a field. Right? So that when we look at the, this wonderful, wonderful thing, it gives us a very nice, you know, I, want, I, I wanted to give you detailed proof, but you know, since everybody objects that I do too much math, I'll just do hand-waving proof. You see, there are certain fields which are the most primitive fields. They're called prime fields, meaning they don't have any proper subfields. For example, real numbers. Are they prime field? No. Why? Rational numbers. So there is a wonderful, wonderful theorem which tells us that the only prime fields are either Z sub P, remain, remainder fields, modular prime, or rational numbers. There are no other prime fields. Nobody will ever discover a prime field other than this. It's a wonderful, wonderful classification theory, right? And that allows us to introduce a notion which of a field characteristic. You take any field, it has a prime field inside, the smallest subfield, which is not prime, because it's either field itself is prime, if it has no subfields, or it will have a prime, some other side. So we take the, the prime subfield, and we know it's either Z sub P or rationals. If it's Z sub P, we say that this big field is of characteristic P. If it is rational numbers, we say it's characteristic zero. So when you hear people talk about fields of characteristic zero, it means that these are fields containing rational numbers. Okay. Another term which you might hear if you, I mean, and there appear in computer science papers all over the place. A uh, term of a Galois field. Galois field are these guys. The finite, the finite fields. Yes? Could a field have multiple subfields? Yes. Let us look. But only one is prime. The prime is the smallest inside. OK, let me, let me prove it. I wanted to prove it. But OK, a field has 0 and 1. Why? Because it's a ring. Okay. So we start adding ones. So the, while you add ones, they either go on forever or loop around. If they loop around, they become zero. If they become zero, the, the first time they become zero when you add ones is going to be a prime number. Why? Otherwise, you will get zero devices. Now, so if they loop, you get one of this. If they do not loop, you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way, all the natural numbers. And you have their negations. So you have all the integers. If you have all the integers, you have ratios of integers. So you have rational numbers. So a field will contain. Either you could sort of start generating it. You know, how, how do you construct this prime field? You literally start adding ones together. If they loop, you get this. If they don't loop, you get all the integers and therefore all the rational numbers. Right? This is, I mean, I wanted to do a formal proof, but was persuaded by you guys not to do it. But it's a, it's a wonderful theorem that, you know, which, which allows us to look at all the fields and sort of understand their structure. In many respects, sort of the beauty of mathematics 
is that it shows that there are certain things which are just so. You cannot have, like, remember Lagrange theorem says that order of a subgroup must divide the order of a group. So however clever you are, you will never come up with a group with 101 elements with a non-trivial subgroup. It's just you cannot do it. Even Zuckerberg cannot do it. Is the ZT considered a sub, uh, subgroup of a rational? No. No, because it isn't. Think about it. OK, let us think about it. Let's take the most basic one, Z sub 2. It's a perfectly nice Galois field with two elements, 0 and 1. 1 plus 1 is 0. Rational numbers, 1 plus 1, is not 0. I mean, it couldn't, I mean, you know, you have, if you are sub something, you have to obey the same rules. It's not just you denote elements with the same glyph. You have to have the same addition tables and multiplication tables. No, it is not a bijection. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, again, complex numbers. Right? And complex numbers are wonderful. By the way, we will be talking about it later, but in case you drop out, let me just tell you, there is an enormous number of wonderful fields between Q and R and C. It's not that they're just rational numbers and then real numbers. Because first of all, there are, in some sense, very few rational numbers and enormous lot of real numbers. We will figure out what it means later on. And there are all kinds, as far as we stay within the domain of algebra, there is a notion of algebraic numbers. Algebraic numbers are numbers which are roots of polynomials. For example, square root of 2, or square, or cubic root of 3, or whatever. These are all algebraic numbers. And there are many subfields of algebraic numbers. For example, there could be a subfield, which is a subfield of the numbers constructible with ruler and compass. These are numbers which you could obtain from rational numbers by adding square roots, but not cubic roots. This is, again, a subfield. They are a rich, wonderful thing. So very many of them. We'll talk more about them. But there is a remarkable theorem which I have to talk Well, so we talked about finite fields. Algebraically closed field is a term which you need to know. The algebraically closed field is a field where every polynomial has a root. Right? Sort of, for example, rational numbers are not algebraically closed. Like x squared minus 2 doesn't have a root. It just doesn't. So algebraic numbers are algebraically closed. Algebraically closed complex numbers are uh, algebraically closed. Real numbers are not algebraically closed. x squared plus 1 does not have a root. Complex numbers are closed. Here I have to tell you uh, something that there is, uh, let's have a break uh, and start, well, let, I could do, finish in five minutes. So let me do it now. So we go from real numbers to complex numbers. We go to a plane, from a line to a plane. And the question is, could we go to further dimensions. Could we have three-dimensional thing like complex numbers? 
I'll, okay, let me tell you. No, we cannot have a field with three-dimensional, you know, structure. We cannot have a complex like three-dimensional space. And again, an Irish, great Irish mathematician, William Hamilton, invented wonderful numbers called quaternions, which allow us to have a field, or almost a field, in four-dimensional space. You see, you could have one-dimensional field, real number, two-dimensional, complex number, and four-dimensional quaternions, except it's not quite a field. It's not commutative. Multiplication is not commutative. You have one i, j, k, and you have the following multiplication table. Observe that i, j is equal k, while j, i is equal minus k. It's whether you go this way or that way, you get minus. So this is the only finite dimensional structure like that. Well, you say, Alex, really the only one? OK, not the only one. You see, if you go to 8, you get something which is almost like a field, except it is not associative. It's not that you don't even have commutativity. You have to drop associativity that of more dimensions less you get, and that known as Actonians or Cayley numbers, because eight Actonians. And at that point, things stop. So it's one, two, four, eight. And this is not my rhyme, but I have to give it to you. One, two, four, eight, dimensions we appreciate. So these are only finite dimensional fields Sort of, again, you, nobody could find any more. We have this wonderful theorem by Frobenius, which says, no more. Right? Sort of, and every time we go from sort of one to another, past complex numbers, we lose an axiom. We go from complex to quaternions, lose commutativity. From quaternions to octonions, we lose associativity. Multiplication, mind Right? So uh, that's why we have sometimes non-commutative fields. Or some people would say instead a division ring. Non-commutative ring with division. But it's, it's a very important, used in physics, you know, wonderful, wonderful thing. By the way, modern vector calculus which is used everywhere, including information retrieval system, came from Hamilton's study of quaternions. It's a long patent, you know, not in these four journeys. If Bill asked me to teach again, maybe I'll teach a linear algebra course, computational linear algebra, and tell you this story. Okay, break. <laughs>